Now to the next speaker, Manuel Petsch. He is the head of the global, is the global head of system biology at Novartis Institute for Biomedical Research in Basel. By training, he's a biochemist. He worked on apoptosis, on the, the complement system, and his interest, sorry, Manuel, his interest led him, in fact, to start working on 3D structure modeling. And this was a big part, I mean, a first part of his career in bioinformatics, where he developed what became a Swiss model. First, it was ProMod, Swiss model, Swiss PDD viewer. You have heard of the further development of those tools by Thorsten, which were, who was in his group at this time with Nicolas Gay also. And in his current position at Novartis, is not doing any more, I think, 3D structure, I mean, but really more working on grid computing and new technology for knowledge extraction. Now, as geographical link, I put uh, Lausanne, where he studied, Frederick, where he did his uh, postdoc, if I remember correctly, Geneva, where he was at the Glaxo Welcome uh, Institute, and Basel, where he's now. I put two names from the group in uh, Basel, where, uh, sorry, in Geneva, where he was for a long time associated with Thorsten and Nicola. And I put all SIM members, because what I have to say also is, uh, Manuel was one of the co-founders of the SIB. He was, his group, while it was at, uh, I mean, before he was at Glaxo, he worked with us to develop the Expasi servers. And when he was at Glaxo, he was instrumental of getting Glaxo to be an industrial group, but within the SIB, which is quite an achievement because industry generally doesn't like this type of, uh, of things where, I mean, you have an academic group, I mean, uh, sorry, an industrial group inside an academic institution. And he has been very, very active in all of the SIB activities. So we were a little bit sad to see him go in Basel because it was for our web, but then at the time, since only Basel joined the SIB, so he could be very active in Basel at the SIB level. And no, not only that, but he's been accepted to become a member of the executive committee of the SIB. So we're really lucky to have him here. And I selected this picture because all the picture I could find on net doesn't show how he's really, in general, always smiling, always happy, because uh, official Novartis pictures, you know, <laughs> I don't know what they did to make you not smile, but it had to be very difficult. <laughs> so thank you, Manuel, for being here. Thank you very much, uh, Amos, for the introduction. Yeah, you can keep it. It's okay. Thank you. Well, it's a, it's a real pleasure to be here today and, and this conference. Um, it's quite a, an emotional moment, actually, because of the long uh, interactions and collaboration, uh, first with Amos, with Ron, with Victor, with Philip, and all the members of the, uh, the SIB. And it's true that uh, some uh, water has gone under the bridges and um, bridges of Basel. Now it is Thorsten who is leading the uh, further development and management of the Swiss model server and uh, the developments around it, including the Swiss PDB viewer. Um, and I've moved on to do, to go after some other interests of mine, uh, which I haven't left uh, structural uh, computing at all in the sense of interest, and I'm still involved with Thorsten and his group. But I wanted to go off and look at some other aspects of computational life sciences. And Novartis, uh, who I have to thank here for this, has actually given me the platform to go after some of those. And they include, as um, Amos said, grid computing, grid computing as applied to uh, high throughput docking and uh, drug discovery, but also other things like, for example, text mining, which I'm going to talk uh, about here today. And more recently, in the context of systems biology, to bring up, to build up a new group in computational systems biology uh, together with a group uh, of proteomics and integrate mathematical and experimental sciences. So what I'm going to talk about is one of the products that came out of an effort over the last five years to bring text mining to a different dimension in uh, life sciences. It is called the Ultralink, and I'll try to explain why. First of all, the industry as well as uh, the academic uh, environment is really faced with a very complex landscape of different data types, different types of information, 
Uh, we have gone from definitions as databases to definitions of information bases, knowledge bases, but underlying behind all these terminologies and these buzzwords, I think this fundamental issue remains is finding and searching and retrieving the proper information from a very different, disparate background and also ability to navigate across those different data types in a seamless manner. And these challenges actually remain to a, in a, large, uh, to a large part. So what we wanted to do is to connect the knowledge bodies and the requirements really were about intelligent integration. And I'll try to explain what intelligent integration means uh, from our perspective. It's about heterogeneous data, and we wanted to enable seamless navigation. Another thing which we want to do is to provide one-stop shops. I think everybody who is using databases, knowledge bases, systems, are, and, and applications in life science computing has to go to many different types of applications, with many different web servers and sites to actually achieve uh, what is needed in a particular project. We want it to be reusable. We want it to be web-based or office application-based. We want it to be intelligent in the sense that it knows something about biology, medicine, chemistry, diseases, business, people, and so on and so forth. Um, it must be on, de uh, on demand. That means things have to run at runtime, on the fly. It has to be easy to use, and it has to be highly configurable. I mean, this sounds like uh, all you dreamed and all you wished for, and represents a considerable number of challenges. So the components that we really need to actually achieve this is about, first of all, is indexing the large heterogeneous data collections, such as databases, full text, and so on and so forth, of, of the literature, for example and to ex enable the semantic expansion, semantic annotation. We need components that allow us to do information retrieval and extraction. We need components that allow us to do entity recognition, whether biological, chemical, uh, medical, uh, or even business types of entities. Um, we need semantic enrichment. We need to have a knowledge map. In other words, we need to be able to navigate the conceptual network. And we need a terminology hub or a component that uh, merges concepts, things such as thesauri and ontologies. And eventually what we need, we need ontology-associated business rules. So what we are doing in the central core of all this, while you can uh, think about all the text mining challenges, you can think about all the in infrastructure and IT challenges, Basically, the, the fundamental, the crux of the success of something like this resides in your terminology. So different knowledge repositories clearly have very different ways to encode a concept. The registry numbers, the unique internal IDs, the concept identifiers, the enumerating terms, for instance, or they're just using different terms without any particular constraints. There are a number of information sources out there which have absolutely no a concept of a controlled vocabularies and ontologies. So a search term in a source A and B may lead to very different results, although the underlying concept, concept exists in both of those sources. So you get false negatives in information retrieval and as well as in information extraction, which leads needs basically to develop a terminology hub that ensures the coherent mapping between coding systems between different representation levels from IDs versus concepts and between local and global terms. Today, we have well over eight gigabytes of cross-referencing information that stems from, uh, for example, in the bioinformatics world, we are using SwissProt as the root, as the reference database, and basically map by transitivity a lot of the other connections that are not represented in DR lines, for example, in SwissProt. But we go far beyond that. We actually map a medical terminology. Uh, we also map a, a, a terminology of uh, companies, businesses, diseases, and so on and so forth. So what we have, chemical entities, at the moment in our terminologies, chemical entities, IUPAC names, trivial names, trade names, INNs, uh, compound codes, ligands, and so on and so forth, which in itself represents already a pretty gigantic terminology 
that all the biological entities, targets, genes, proteins, modes of actions, um, but modes of actions of compounds such as inhibitors, activators, binders, and so on and so forth, diseases, as well as indications, side effects, contraindications, and so on, institutions, affiliation, people, geographic locations, and well over another, uh, and many more uh, items that are being indexed uh, in our, and represented in our terminology hub. At the moment, that uh, leads us to have something well over 1.5 million terms. So, on these premises, the Ultralink is a revolutionary tool that to navigate this knowledge space. First of all, what it does, um, it uses a concept called zoning. In other words, this is a process that uses our meta-knowledge about information that is coded for each source and then tags the relevant context in the document, the database records. Then within following zoning, for example, where you would identify zones in, a, in an abstract, it would be uh, the abstract itself, the body of the abstract, but is also the authors, the affiliations, and so on and so forth. Uh, some of our internal documents have very complex structures, and so zoning has become extremely important to extract the right type of information from the right type of, uh, right part of the document. Then we identify terms based on terminology and on regular expressions, term identification, to identify the lexical items in a text, um, but we also uh, identify regular expressions such as, for example, Swiss product accession codes and so on and so forth. Concept identification, which basically identifies concepts uh, related to the reference terms. And finally, type assignment, which assigns a concept type related to a concept identifier. So eventually, you know whether you are talking about the disease, whether you're talking about the protein, whether you're talking about the gene, and so on and so forth. We extract these items and we normalize them. That means that we look how they map from the local terminology onto the global terminology so that we are always using the same global term as the root of the tree. And eventually we get a list of rules to apply. First of all, we verify that everything that is we are going to link to actually exists. So we are not going to link to applications or to pages on the web, for example, which do not exist. So there's a verification of the existence of the target beforehand. We apply those rules and eventually display these ultralinks. Now, how do they, how do they look? Well, if you, are, if you think about the user experience and that you're actually talking about a, um, a, a navigation in Google or a search session in Google, you will type in an, a, a word, you will find a couple of, or a, a hundred or a thousand or ten thousands of hits, and you will go down the list trying to guess from what you see which one is the most appropriate, and you usually have to go to a few of them to find eventually what you really want. But once you've been there, you're there and that's it. You have to come back to this Google page to do your next search, unless there's a hyperlink in there, and the hyperlink is very clear, it is a word or a section of text or an image that is linked to another, one other page. What the Ultralink is capable of doing is actually associating those terms on the fly with a meaningful set of options that are within the context of the text in which they were extracted from. So for example, there was a term that in a piece of text that says Wilms tumor well, the Wilms tumor on one hand is a disease, it's a nephroblastoma, but it's also a gene name, and from a company's perspective, it's also a target for, for, for drug development. And the way we look at this ambiguity in terms of concept types, it's either a disease, a gene name, or a target, and for each one of those concept types, we offer automatically very different types of links if it's a disease, we talk about internal project and, and, and things like this. We talk about um, products on the market. You can look at and compute uh, the competitive intelligence databases for all the products on the market that would address that type of disease and so on. If it's about the gene name, then we can go into pathway identification and uh, genome information, proteome information, and so on and so forth. But if it's a drug target, it will eventually uh, allow us even to, uh, to look at the uh, reagents that we have within our own uh, environment. 
in terms of uh, normalization, what that means, uh, if, I, for example, I search with a term like mTOR, then mammalian target of rapamycin is, in fact, the normalized term. And in both cases, whether I select mammalian target of rapamycin or I actually look, actually look for mTOR here, in both cases, I get the same normalized term from which the whole rule set to provide these links is being computed. So, how do they, what that actually happens is that if I take uh, a link here in the text, which is GMCSF, I can actually look at synonyms, I can look at the various terms, local terms, local to databases such as EMBL, PubMed, NCBI, Go, Uniprot, and so on and so forth, and use those to build a list of links, which themselves are then hyperlinks and as Okay. We can also, for example, automatically take a, a particular gene, TCF7L2, a gene code, and automatically search uh, through the ultralinking system in our pathway databases and eventually rebuild, for example, a particular network uh, in GeneGo all in one click. Similar things are true for protein structures. Basically, a particular gene, the ultralink will go and look whether yes or no, there is a protein structure available. If there's a protein structure available, it will provide a link and it automatically starts software to visualize such, to, such uh, structures. Uh, we have the possibility in our world also to, uh, to go through external sites such as uh, Exact Antigen, which provides uh, purchasing, uh, reagent purchasing mechanisms, but also patent information about particular types of, uh, of, um, of a particular uh, proteins, and the patent information is another very rich source uh, of knowledge that I think has to be further exploited. Um, other types of reagents, uh, here is an on-the-fly reconstruction of a, uh, of a GeneGo map. So the map is taken from a GeneGo server, and on the fly we can read uh, where we have antibodies in our fridges that are validated in, in an experimental setting and automatically highlight, for example, uh, these pathways with the tools that we have at our disposition. So these are the type of uh, integration a first step of integration between informatics, pathway informatics, and systems biology, where uh, the, the bioinformatics group, together with the proteomics group, are thinking about the best ways to enable um, uh, the proper uh, research processes. When I say business, uh, when I talk about uh, business items in our ontologies, I think uh, in particular about uh, ontologies of companies. Uh, we have uh, over 30 years of uh, merger and acquisition uh, history that is coded into our ontology so we know who has bought whom when and who belongs to whom uh, at the end of the day. So basically, uh, this is a picture which was taken before uh, Chiron was merged into Novartis. Uh, if now I would do the same exact click on this Chiron here, the normalized term here would come up as Novartis because it would say, basically the background that this belongs is part of Novartis. So the whole web servers, web, uh, websites, and so on and so forth would redirect through the uh, central server. Uh, in the chemistry world, we have similar capabilities. Here, this is Gleevec. Uh, Gleevec is associated, obviously, with a lot of information. And we can recognize automatically these compound codes and provide links to chemoinformatics tools, but also product information tools, as well as, for example, uh, the, the, the structure where uh, of uh, the DCR of the, uh, the ABLE kinase with the, key, uh, the, the Gleevec structure in there. So where, does the imp where can we implement something like the Ultralinker? Well, in the beginning, we actually implemented it as a component within a portal that allows us to do uh, information integration and cross-source searching, and that has been uh, the initial uh, type of uh, implementation that we did. Now, basically, what we can do is have it as an additional plugin 
that would run over uh, Internet Explorer. A page comes down the Internet Explorer. If you click on the little button Ultralink, the text goes off to the, to the text mining and ultralinking engine. It's completely analyzed, comes back, and you have all your links available. Then on the next click, you request the menu for the term you're interested in, and from there you can then go off and do your further exploration. Now this seems all very good, uh, Internet Explorer, but is Internet Explorer the only place where we can do this? Well, the answer, I mean, here's a, first of all, here's an example. This is a very s a standard uh, PubMed uh, page uh, looking at a particular article, and here you can automatically see that by clicking on the little Ultralink Doc, uh, uh, button here, we have identified uh, on those uh, yellow and reddish uh, background, we have identified terms in the context of this particular article and the different codes, color codes, actually talk about the different root ontologies they belong to. When I do a mouse over, I basically get display ultralinks and at that moment the menu in a new window will appear. Uh, this is just to show, illustrate the fact that this is a completely different type of web page. This is, comes from Nature, so it's an article in Nature that we have just clicked on this little button here and on this button here and basically completely ultralinked. And as you can see, the HSP90, uh, gelatinomycin, and so on and so forth are all color coded and automatically connected to the world of information that uh, we have configured. Now we can do the same thing in Microsoft Office. Basically, you read, open a document, a Word document, you say ultralink, and all the terms, the whole text that is in your Word documents, or the selected text, because you can actually select the text with the mouse, goes off, is analyzed, and comes back ultralink and connects basically any document to any information source or application that we have configured. So for example, um, uh, we, 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 if we have a Swiss product session code, the, uh, one of the ultralinks offered behind the Swiss product session code would actually be uh, starting a blast job. So basically it would open a blast server page, it would paste in the sequence and so on and so forth. It, we do all this automatic selection of of uh, options that it can do based on the fact that it knows it's a, it's a sequence and so on and so forth. And eventually, you can launch your Blast job right from there or a multi or alignment job, whatever it is, uh, or pro-site search straight out of a Word document. Another example here is just to show you, taken here a, uh, a, uh, a Wikipedia page, and rather than going, having to go in and to start hyperlinking every word in your Wikipedia page and so on and so forth, we just, we can take a very flat file of Wikipedia, say Ultralink, um, and then I, I don't, I can't see, I can't see it right here now, but basically what it says here, Novartis uh, keyword, imatinib, show the Ultralinks, and click on this, and it will do, and will lead you there. Lead you there. Uh, same here as another example for CML. CML being understood as uh, a disease name is an, is an abbreviation for, uh, for a particular form of uh, leukemia. Uh, just to show uh, that this also works with Excel, here is a list of gene names in the left column that connected to uh, the Ultralink. Uh, this particular gene name here will then pop up a whole series of, of, of options. Uh, if I open the disease, open the disease information uh, tab here, I will be able to go to MIM and automatically go to the MIM entry and representation that we have developed in our uh, internal uh, platform. And if I click here on the information, I will actually know all the synonyms that are being recognized behind uh, SLC12A3. So basically, I have a full understanding and of it, uh, ability as a human user to de disambiguate the information I'm looking at. So here I'd like to, uh, to end here. Um, uh, my laptop is actually able to make a connection 
so to this system from here, I've tested it. So if people are interested in seeing how it actually works, I'm, I'm quite happy to show that. But I would like really to acknowledge uh, the people who um, who have been the uh, the artisans behind this, uh, from Therese Vachon, who is the leader uh, of the uh, text mining and computational knowledge management group in my department, and uh, Martin Romac, uh, Pierre Parizeau, and Nicolas Grandjean, Pierre, Brigitte uh, Charpieu and Jean-Marc von Altenemann, who are uh, the ontologist and text mining experts, and then Daniel Cronenberger and Olivier Kreim, who are the technologist and uh, IT implementation uh, leaders uh, for this particular effort. Thank you very much. Okay, so do we have any questions, please? Does your system support the separation of important from unimportant um, information? I think the more information is available, the more time will be wasted reading unimportant or unreliable uh, information. The question is whether your systems gives confidence value or any kind of help to the user to separate important from unimportant information? Well, no, not, not like this, because the judgment of important versus unimportant is a very personal thing. Um, what it does is you have the possibility to configure where you link to, okay? Which basically means that if you only believe that is writ what is written in a certain category of journals and in one particular type of database, that is where you can link to. Um, but we don't have a heuristic system in the background that tells you how important something is or not. We do this a priori by selecting the environment to which we link through the Ultralink, because that's completely configurable, it's very easy to configure. So we've added basically the things which are important to us. Okay, so there appears to be no other questions, so I just remember to thank the speaker one more time. Manuel Peach, thank you.